Today's webinar is focused on the support required for local off-grid small and medium enterprises. Before we begin, I'll quickly go over some of the webinar features. For audio, you have two options. You may either listen through your computer or over the telephone. If you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. If you want to dial in by phone, please select the telephone option and a box on the right side will display the telephone number and audio pin you should use to dial in. If you would like to ask a question, we ask that you use the questions pane where you may type in your question. The audio recording and presentations will be posted to the Solution Center training page within a few days of the broadcast and will be added to the Solution Center YouTube channel where you will find other informative webinars as well as video interviews and th with thought leaders on clean energy policy topics. Finally, one important note of mention before we begin our presentation is that the Clean Energy Solutions Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solutions Center Resource Library as one of many best practice resources reviewed and selected by technical experts. Today's webinar agenda is centered around the presentations from our guest panelists who have joined us to highlight the challenges of last mile distribution and potential solutions for off-grid energy enterprises and companies to scale. Before we jump into the presentations, I will provide a quick overview of the Clean Energy Solutions Center. And Ruchi Sony from the United Nations Foundation will provide a quick overview of Energy Access Practitioners Network. Then, following the panelists' presentations, we will have a question and answer session where the panelists will address questions submitted by the audience. At the end of the webinar, you will be automatically prompted to fill out a brief survey as well. So thank you in advance for taking a moment to respond. The Solution Center was launched in 2011 under the Clean Energy Ministerial. The Clean Energy Ministerial is a high-level global forum to promote policies and programs that advance clean energy technology, to share lessons learned and best practices, and to encourage the transition to a global clean energy co economy. 24 countries and the European Commission are members, contributing 90% of clean energy investment and responsible for 75% of global greenhouse gas emissions. This webinar is provided by the Clean Energy Solutions Center, which is an initiative of the Clean Energy Ministerial. The Solutions Center focuses on helping government policymakers design and adopt policies and programs that support the deployment of clean energy technologies. This is accomplished through support in crafting and implementing policies related to energy access, no-cost expert policy assistance, and peer-to-peer -peer learning and training tools, such as this webinar. The Clean Energy Solutions Center is co-sponsored by the government of, governments of Australia, Sweden, and the United States. The Solutions Center provides several clean energy policy programs and services, including a team of over 60 global experts that can provide remote and in-person technical assistance to governments and government-supported institutions, no-cost virtual webinar trainings on a variety of clean energy topics, partnership building with development agencies and regional and global organizations to deliver support, an online library containing over 2,500 clean energy policy related publications, tools, videos, and other resources. Our primary audience is made up of energy policy makers and analysts from governments and technical organizations in all countries, but we also strive to engage with the private sector, NGOs, and civil society. The Solution Center is an international initiative that works with more than 35 international partners across its suite of different programs. Several of the partners are listed above and includes research organizations like IRENA and the IEA, programs like C4ALL, and regionally focused entities such as ECOWAS, Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency. A marquee feature that the Solution Center provides is the no-cost expert policy assistance known as Ask an Expert. 
The Ask an Expert service matches policymakers with one of the more than 60 global experts selected as authoritative leaders on specific clean energy finance and policy topics. For example, in the area of grid integration, we are pleased to have Hugo Lucas, head of Factor, serving as one of our experts. If you have a need for policy assistance in grid integration or any other clean energy sector, we encourage you to use this valuable service. Again, the assistance is provided free of charge. If you have a question for our experts, please submit it through our simple online form at cleanenergysolutions.org slash expert. We also invite you to spread the word about this service to those in your networks and organizations. Today's webinar is co-moderated by Ruchi Soni, who is Manager of Energy Access at the UN Foundation, where she oversees the Energy Access Practitioner Network and the Foundation's involvement in the Mini Grids Partnership, MGP. Now I'd like to provide brief introductions for today's panelists. First up today is Emma Collenbrander, who is head of the Global Distribution Distributors Collective at Practical Action, where she also leads the Energy Markets Consulting Portfolio. Following Emma, you will hear from Aaron Davis, who is a founding member and vice president of Social Investment Managers and Advisors, SIMA, and Impact Asset Manager with presence in New York, Nairobi, Kar Karachi, and Geneva. And our final speaker today is Dan Murphy, who is the founder and director of Catalyst Off-Grid Advisors, with over 20 years experience working in over 20 sub-Saharan African countries. And with those introductions, I'd like to welcome Ruchi to the webinar. Great, thank you, Philip. Can you see my PowerPoint? Perfect. Yes, I can. Pleasure to be here. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, depending on where you are. My name is Ruchi Soni, and I'm the manager of Energy Access at the UN Foundation. We are pleased to be co-hosting this very interesting discussion on what it takes for local, off-grid, small and medium energy enterprises to thrive and scale. My role for this webinar will be that as a co-moderator for this discussion. If, if the registration numbers are any indication of the interest in this webinar, especially in this beginning of the holiday season, we've had a good response of close to over 220 people who registered. So many th thanks to all of those who who've tuned in. Next slide, please. Let me start with a bit of a background on Energy Access Practitioner Network, or EAPN as we call it. It is a UN Foundation, it's a, uh, it's a UN Foundation initiative to, initiative to support the Sustainable Development Goals number seven of universal access to affordable, reliable, and modern energy services. This slide pretty much sums up what the Practitioner Network is about. It essentially is a field building global platform that connects practitioners to each other and to resources. It was established seven years ago in 2011 as a contribution to sustainable energy for all. The network's overarching aim is to support the development of market led decentralized energy access solutions and businesses. Next slide, please. We carried out this mission in three main ways. One, by helping unify the sector two, by accelerating the learning, and three, by elevating the distributed energy access agenda. We have a number of different ways of accomplishing this mission and what I like to call through three C's of these doorstep services. Number one, creating market intelligence through surveys and Number two, convening the sector through webinars like this one and events so that the stakeholders are able to share knowledge. And finally, through communicating news and sector highlights through our bi-monthly newsletter, social media, and our website. To give you a sense of where we are now and what we started off with, we started out with about 20 members in our network, but we now have over 2,500 members representing almost over 1,400 organizations active in uh, almost 170 countries. These include entrepreneurs, companies, social enterprises, and NGOs, as well as financing institution and funds, of which approximately one third are SMEs. A little, about, a little bit about the webinar itself, where we'll be talking about the support required for these local off-grid companies. 
The webinar will present the challenges of last mile distribution and solutions required for off-grid energy enterprises and companies to scale. We're increasingly seeing the emergence and push towards this creation of an enabling ecosystem and the fragmented sector to eventually come together to support these last mile distributors and SMEs. I'm pleased to have fellow panelists join me to discuss this gap, barrier, and support for the sector. Lastly, before handing it over to Emma, who's the head of this Global Distributors Collective at Practical Action, we encourage you all to contribute to the conversation on social media. We're using the hashtag, hashtag PN webinar, where PN stands for the Practitioner Network, and do follow our Twitter handle at Energy Access PN. Over to you, Emma, now. Great, thank you very much, Ruchi. All right, hopefully you can all uh, see my, my screen. Um, so my name is Emma Collinbrander and I am the head of the Global Distributors Collective uh, at Practical Action. Uh, and today I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the, the challenges that last mile distribution companies face and how the Global Distributors Collective came about in response to those challenges. Uh, and the support services that we're working to provide to distribution companies through the Global Distributors Collective. So fundamentally, the problem is one of access, uh, and that's not just in the off-grid energy space. Um, so some of these numbers will be very familiar to you, um, but as I, as I say, it's, it's across sectors. So we're interested in the access gap, not just for people who lack access to electricity and clean cooking, but more broadly, who lack access to clean water, to sanitation and to proper nourishment. Even though products that are good enough and affordable enough do exist, uh, they're not easily accessible to the underserved populations who need those products. Um, and the reason for that is because reaching low income or vulnerable or marginalized communities who often live in very rural and sparsely populated areas is hard and it's expensive. So last mile distribution companies do exist. Um, there are quite a lot of them and they sell life-changing products to underserved households. Um, and they are often the only companies that are selling to the poorest customer segments in the most risky and remote areas. In the off-grid space, this is in contrast to the, the pay-as-you-go solar sector's focus, which is on selling higher value products, solar home systems and above, in more densely populated areas to customers who tend to live under the grid and, and above the poverty line. Um, and that's a distinction that we've drawn between the last mile distribution companies that we seek to support and the pay-go vertically integrated companies who, who tend to be Western founded, who are, are serving a, 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 a better served market. But even though these last mile distribution companies exist, they face a huge range of challenges and they are dramatically under supported. So this slide, just touches on a couple of the challenges that distribution companies face. At the customer level, distributors are working with very poor customers who are risk averse, who have very little knowledge and awareness about products that can potentially improve their lives. Um, they are living often in remote areas and they lack access to finance to purchase products. Um, on the business level, uh, products are expensive, margins are very squeezed, distributors struggle to access finance, uh, they have poor access to information about what services are, are there to, to support them, um, and they really struggle with attracting and training and retaining a sales force. Um, finally, on the policy and investment front, distributors struggle to navigate difficult importation processes and high taxation, investors don't have a good understanding of last mile distribution and we often hear from investors, last mile distribution companies simply aren't bankable and the unit economics just don't work. And there's a lack of market intelligence where very few people actually understand the last mile distribution sector and who are, who are all these companies, where are they operating, what are they selling, what is their customer profile, look like um, and how can they best be supported. So particularly in the off-grid space, uh, the main mechanisms that are used to support businesses that serve last mile communities have been things like challenge funds, results-based financing and concessional financing instruments. 
And while these financing mechanisms are, are, are great and putting new capital into the space, they're benefiting the bigger, more established companies that are seen as, as low risk. And so those are more of the sort of vertically integrated PAYGO companies that I talked about before. Um, one sort of challenge we see on the financing side is that donors tend to prefer companies who are delivering higher levels of energy access. Um, so often donors focus on tier two and above, um, which means that distributors who are selling more basic products like solar lanterns uh, are excluded from those financing mechanisms. And that steers support away from companies who are reaching poorer consumers who actually can't afford higher value products. So the Global Distributors Collective came about when a number of distributors came together and realised that we were all reinventing the wheel to solve common challenges uh, and we shared frustration with the lack of support that the last mile distribution sector received. We saw that the sector was very fragmented with a large number of, of small companies and that there was this opportunity to unify the sector and to build one voice for the sector and to put a spotlight on distribution and, and show that distribution really is the essential, the essential segment. Um, and so this was about two years ago and, and, and after some further consultation, Practical Action decided to incubate this initiative um, because the distributors who came together lacked the capacity or the resources to, to do it themselves. So over the last two years, we've been designing the Global Distributors Collective uh, in consultation with hundreds of, of last mile distributors and, and, and other stakeholders in the sector to make sure we can build something that really works um, for last mile distribution companies. So what is the Global Distributors Collective? Uh, we are a collective of last mile distributors around the world that reach millions of un underserved customers with life changing products. And fundamentally, our goal is to help distributors to do what they do and to do it better and to do it at scale. And underpinning everything that we do is a philosophy that last mile distributors have a critical role to play in achieving the sustainable development goals, but that mainstream approaches to support distributors are inadequate and inappropriate. And instead, we need collaborative, bottom-up, innovative approaches that support the sector as a whole, rather than picking individual winners and putting all our eggs in, in, in one basket. So we've got two main approaches to supporting distributors through the Global Distributors Collective. So the first is that we are developing ways of helping distributors improve business performance and grow um, by providing services that help save time, bring down costs, build capacity and develop new partnerships. And secondly, we're building a collective voice for the sector by generating and sharing learning, raising the profile of distributors and helping the broader, broader ecosystem to work better with distributors. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about what that looks like in practice and what some of the activities are that will be that will be kicking off uh, early next year. Uh, first of all, we will be piloting a centralized purchasing platform uh, and that is likely going to be in West Africa uh, and that is designed to support distributors with procurement. So to, to, to set up an intermediary that can help aggregate demand from distributors uh, and work directly with suppliers to, to uh, improve the terms and conditions that distributors can get um, on their on their contracts with suppliers and to provide support with uh, with importation and with freight and to try and save some of that time and risk that distribute that distributors face uh, in in um, in procuring uh, products and we'll likely start with uh, solar solar lights um, as the sort of key product category for that platform with the potential to expand into other product categories in the future. Uh, secondly, we'll be facilitating a range of learning and collaboration events specifically for distribution companies. So we'll be bringing distributors together in across East Africa uh, in regional capitals over the next couple of years and we'll be doing things like site visits and peer-to-peer -peer learning and matchmaking and so on and we'll do a lot of consultation with our uh, with our members in order to design those events to make sure that they are as appropriate and as useful as possible for distributors. Thirdly, we'll be running innovation pilots. So what this looks like is we will be doing an open call to our membership 
uh, and we will be asking distributors to submit ideas for innovations that they want to test um, that can be replicated by other distributors across the sector and we'll be particularly interested in innovations that are rooted in collaboration uh, and we'll look to disseminate the lessons learnt from those pilots and work with distributors to replicate um, those pilots that have proven to be successful. Fourthly, we're developing centralised training services, both digital training services and face-to-face -face training services, and those are particularly focused on working at sort of the sales manager level and supporting middle management to work with their sales agents and, and, and retailers. Um, and that's targeting things like sales and marketing, customer service, and particularly sort of gender and how we can better mainstream gender uh, in last mile distribution companies. Uh, uh, number five, we will be publishing a groundbreaking state of the sector report next year. And the purpose of that report is really to make the sector more transparent. Um, as I said before, there's very, very little information about exactly what the last mile distribution sector looks like. There's limited understanding of what are the, the market failures and the barriers that prevent distributors from reaching meaningful scale and how those barriers can be overcome um, and how a uh, temporary public finance intervention can support last mile distributors to reach their full potential. So that's what that report will be, will be looking to do and we'll be working alongside um, donors and investors and governments to try and implement some of the recommendations that come out of that report. Finally, we're looking to build a really engaged community of practice. Um, we think that the best learning for distribution companies can come from distributors themselves. Um, we're soon going to be releasing a, a podcast series on last mile distribution where you'll get to hear directly from practitioners about some of the, the challenges that they've cracked in their last mile distribution companies um, and we'll be doing webinar series and uh, putting out uh, a whole lot of content and case studies and stories um, and trying to connect distributors both to each other but also to other stakeholders in the space who might be able to provide support or services. So as I mentioned, some of these activities have a regional focus and the reason is because we're trying to demonstrate that these type of collective approaches can have an, a direct impact on business performance of last mile distribution companies. But we are hoping that in the future we'll be able to replicate and expand some of these activities um, and pilot new activities um, that can be across, uh, across other regions as well. We are global. We work with members um, not just in Western East Africa, but in Southern Africa, uh, Asia and Latin America. So the Global Distributors Collective is for companies that are primarily focused on distributing life-changing products at the household level. Companies might be exclusive distributors of one company's products. They could distribute products from a range of companies. They might even produce their own products, um, but their core business is distribution. Um, they sell products that uh, contribute towards the sustainable development goals and they target underserved households. That doesn't necessarily mean they're, they're, they're remote. They could be urban slums. Um, but they are low income or vulnerable or in some way discriminated or against or, or marginalized and not reached by the mainstream private sector. We have about 100 uh, last mile distribution companies who are now members of the GDC since we formally launched about three weeks ago um, and we are uh, signing up new members all the time um, and members vary from early stage companies to established social enterprises to national uh, SMEs to international SMEs. Uh, we have quite a broad membership base. Um, if you are interested to, to become a member of the GDC and you think you meet our criteria, uh, then you can visit our website to sign up and, and we'll set up a conversation with you to talk a little bit more about your company and how we might be able to support you. To give you a bit of background on governance um, and funding partners, uh, we are currently hosted within Practical Action uh, and our key implementing partners are Hystra and the BOP Innovation Centre. Um, we're funded by the Department for International Development in the UK, P4G uh, and a couple of others. Um, and what we're working to do now is to develop an appropriate governance structure to make sure that uh, we can be truly representative of distributors and truly accountable uh, to distributors um, and so we're working through what that looks like now for our membership and to ensure we can have distributor representation in all of our decision making processes. 
So very keen to hear your ideas for what else we can do to support sector-wide growth. Uh, and my contact details are on the following slide here. Um, so if you do have any questions or any feedback or suggestions, then I would love to hear from you. Please get in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emma. Uh, up next, we have Erin Davis from SIMA. Erin? Great, thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Erin Davis from SEMA Fund, Social Investment Managers and Advisors. Um, we're a social uh, asset management company that launched in um, early 2016. We currently have a senior debt fund in the off-grid solar sector um, focused on some of these larger um, off-grid players um, and also microfinance institutions that are playing a part in the distribution of energy access. Um, you know, they are either wanting to incorporate solar products or have already incorporated into their, into their product mix. Um, SEMA is a team of about 13 people. We have offices in Nairobi and Karachi, New York, and Geneva, Switzerland. Um, and so we, our first fund largely focused on, on Africa and South Asia um, with a variety of debt products um, for the off-grid sector. And, and through that experience, we saw sort of anecdotally that there was so many other players that, um, you know, were playing a part in the sector and had, um, you know, real capability to be um, contributing to the energy access issues that, that Emma described earlier, um, but that our, you know, fund structure wasn't, wasn't set up to support those types of players. Um, so over the past year or so, we've been looking at putting together a, a new structure that would focus on the new generation of, of solar distributors. Um, so we developed the new generation solar consortium for growth financing and knowledge capital for young and locally owned off-grid solar distributors. So what this means is that we we're calling it a consortium um, because it it combines finance with technical assistance and and knowledge sharing um, so the key features of it is that it's intended to be a 30 million dollar structure um, and support companies over five years it's it's strictly debt uh, with two types of debt products a quasi equity product um, that has a revenue share component and then a structured pay-as-you-go debt that um, helps companies buy inventory and then the fund itself has a self-generating technical assistance um, pot of money that we're, you know, hoping to support companies um, in some of the ways that Emma described um, to become more investable companies. And then finally, a platform um, potentially building on the UN Foundation's Energy Access Practitioner Network um, with a carve out for these um, smaller locally owned distributors. So I'll come back to this, um, but just wanted to talk about a few things that we have seen in the sector. Um, I think we'll start hearing this story more and more, and, and we, we are all aware that off-grid funding has been asymmetric. Um, most of the funding, including from, from our current fund, has gone to larger players um, that are you know, US and European owned. Um, and in 2016, 60 million dollars, 223 million dollars were raised, but 60 million of it went to two companies alone. Um, and so this is um, this is uh, the Shell Foundation catalyst. You'll hear from Dan Murphy in a little while. Um, so this 
slide should be recognizable to him. But, um, you know, I think it's just a, a really good visual of if we continue business as usual funding, you know, the same people over and over, we are going to miss SDG 7 by more than 100 million households. So over the you know, we have we have now the research and we've also seen over the year anecdotally and just being out in the field that there are hundreds of second and third generation distributors operating ac across the globe. Um, and there some of them are not um, quite investable yet, but they they're targets for us because they understand the needs and the particularities of the local markets. Um, so we, to date, have actually been able to make investments in some of these companies already through a grant with the USAID SOGE program um, into companies like Eris um, and Echo Energy in Pakistan um, and are, are considering several other companies within our current fund. So some of the challenges that uh, we're seeing for distributors that are also challenges for us as an investor um, are, are similar to, um, you know, the, the slide that Emma presented, um, that they're, you know, really on the end user level, the, the company or the business level, and then the macro level. Um, and so I think, you know, we, we know that the end user level is is extremely important. Um, obviously, they're the ones that are supporting these companies. Um, so, you know, customers have experienced poor after sales service. Um, you know, the markets have been flooded with, um, you know, less than quality products. Um, affordability is a huge issue. Uh, and then just generally exposure to the benefits of solar products um, to get a, a customer to um, adopt a solar product. I think number two, um, the on the company level is sort of the areas where SEMA is focusing. Um, it's at the company level that um, we would love to finance companies like these, um, but we can't do so with our current structure. Um, you know, we have commercial investors who are seeking commercial returns, um, and it's, it's more difficult to, um, to finance without the right um, debt products because of uh, the company's, you know, weak balance sheet, perhaps a limited track record, um, and no outside financing, the lack of profitability, and then you add in the, the very high liquidity needs, um, especially for a pay-go model where, you know, you're being paid back over 18, 24 months. Um, and then just in general, um, what we've seen is, you know, companies, just need to know what investors are looking for, um, what types of information they should be capturing. Um, so that's on the company level. And then finally, uh, Emma touched on, on a lot of the macro level issues. Um, and so, you know, we, we all, as in FEMA and UN Foundation and um, Global Distributors Collective, are, are thinking about ways that we can work together to address some of these issues. So, so that's um, some of the challenges that, that led us to developing the new generation solar consortium. Um, so as I mentioned, it's a five year structure um, starting with $30 million. Um, and we're looking at developing a couple different types of debt products that uh, focus on different needs of off-grid players. Um, so first, the quasi-equity is a, a revenue share product over the five-year period. And it would start with um, a very low interest rate. 
um, and serve as, you know, just general working capital for these companies. Um, and this can be partnered with uh, or paired with the structured PAYGO debt. Um, this PAYGO debt is what we have um, already done a few times in our current fund. And this relies on the cash flows of the pay-as-you-go payments and builds up a cash reserve. Um, so, so we work in partnership. It's um, a three-party agreement with a manufacturer, a distributor, and SEMA. Um, so we will um, sign this agreement and then send a couple hundred thousand dollars to a manufacturer. The manufacturer will send inventory to the distributor um, and both parties put in a portion of their margin um, that serves as this cash reserve. So we don't have to rely as much on the company's balance sheet um, because we have this, this cushion. Um, typically, SEMA takes um, some type of collateral, um, some type of security. Um, in this case, it can be inventory. Um, the technical assistance is, is not necessarily a um, defined program. Um, you know, each company that we see has different needs um, and so would just in general contribute to their overall investability um, over time. Um, so any sort of weaknesses we see from an underwriting perspective, we would then try to translate into technical assistance. Um, and then finally, the platform, um, building out the energy access practitioner network taken on by the UN Foundation um, to promote some of this knowledge sharing, um, possibly matchmaking opportunities and exposure, um, just demonstrating to the broader audience that there's a lot of investment opportunities out there if the right structures exist. Um, so for the investors who are listening, uh, this would be the fund structure. Um, so we'd have three different tranches that you could invest into, a first loss equity-like tranche, a senior tranche, and a super senior tranche. Um, the th three products, um, the asset side, uh, are listed there. So I spoke about the structured debt and inventory financing and the structured revenue share uh, financing. And then we also have incorporated into the model some bullet loans um, for uh, relatively more advanced companies. SEMA also um, promotes a code of conduct. So all of our loan agreements incorporate a code of conduct. Um, and, you know, I, uh, Gogla has been developing one, so we would uh, um, adapt to, to that code of conduct. Um, but essentially, SEMA views one of the biggest risks in the off-grid sector um, is really geared around um, customer service and, you know, making sure that your end user is happy. And so this can be achieved in broad areas, you know, making sure you have a quality product, um, making sure that the cost is transparent and what you're providing to the customer is of value. We don't necessarily believe you have to be the cheapest um, product on the market, but you have to demonstrate that the product is of value. And then finally, uh, good after sales service. Um, so, you know, if, if you install the product and then it stops working, your customer stops paying, um, and that becomes a, a big challenge. So, uh, I mentioned earlier that we have, uh, done one of these inventory financing um, to a smaller distributor. Um, and this particular company, Eris, um, is a company in Benin, Togo, and Burkina Faso. Um, very interesting company. Um, and uh, we really like them because they had a few different um, 
diverse lines of revenue. Um, they were, you know, one of the first to bring Pago to Benin, um, and now with a loan from us of 500,000, they are further expanding into that market. Um, they also have uh, productive use products from Victron Energy, um, and then a third line of revenue from engineering and commission installations. Um, so, you know, it has been largely funded um, through private capital from the founders, um, inventory financing from SEMA, um, grant funding, results-based funding. So they've They've really done a lot with a little, um, but have truly demonstrated their, you know, um, ability to operate in this market. Um, and so with that, I, uh, you know, look forward to hearing from all of you out there. Um, please, if you're a, you know, potential company or potential investor, we'd love to hear from you and you can contact me here. Thanks so much. Thank you, Aaron. We'll now be switching to Dan Murphy from Catalyst Off Grid. Dan? Great. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, really, really looking forward to the discussion with you all this morning. And I just want to kick things off by taking a few minutes to tell you about Venture Builder, which um, is uh, an exciting new uh, platform that my firm, Catalyst Off-Grid Advisors, has been uh, developing in partnership with uh, Open Capital Advisors over the past couple of years. And uh, just quick background on Catalyst. Um, we are a boutique advisory firm that focuses exclusively on the energy access challenge and we do a lot of work with investors, with entrepreneurs, with foundations, um, philanthropies and, and with government, governments um, in, in emerging markets. And um, also just on Open Capital Advisors, they are a, a Nairobi based management consulting firm. Uh, one of their core business lines is uh, supporting investors and businesses uh, related to energy access, particularly in Africa. So some of the slides that you're going to see here are uh, going to be somewhat familiar. <laughs> and so what I'm going to do is um, try to skip to um, some of the most salient features. So you just saw this this slide uh, a couple of minutes ago from Erin. And as she mentioned, uh, this is you know one of the main takeaways that came out of a piece of work that our firm um, conducted last year in conjunction with the Shell Foundation. And you know basically demonstrates that um, even despite the tremendous access, uh, sorry, um, progress that has been made with respect to energy access, and I think particularly around some of the technology and business model innovations that we've seen over the past few years, um, in a business as usual scenario, um, the the industry is is not even going to to make a dent in uh, the access deficit. So um, the model that we built out projected that by 2030, there would still be a deficit of, of over 100 million households on the African continent that would, would still um, not have access to, to modern energy services. Um, meanwhile, as, as uh, many of you know, there have been pretty tremendous advances on um, the technology front over the past years, particularly with respect to um, solar panels, with respect to battery technology, particularly lithium ion uh, battery chemistries, and with LED lighting arrays. And uh, when you combine those three ingredients, um, you're able to uh, deliver products that can really uh, transform lives at uh, in a in a robust and reliable and, and affordable way. And uh, when you combine that that technology with further business model innovations around the the pay as you go business model, uh, whereby customers are able to pay for products uh, in installments over time, it's a it's a real a real game changer that. 
um, uh, we're all very, very excited about. And, um, you know, part of the, the consequence of, of that enthusiasm and the evolution of that business model has been a significant amount of, of capital moving in to support the sector um, in its earlier years that was heavily oriented toward um, equity capital, as you see here. And uh, particularly in the last couple of years, the, the volume of debt uh, as those businesses have matured has, has increased considerably. Um, as they need to, to leverage that equity and, and bring debt in to, to grow their businesses. Um, and again, very similar to, to what um, Aaron pointed out a couple of minutes ago, I think the, you know, the, the general observation has been, and I mean, we've been associated with, with the industry from its, its earliest days, both on the catalyst and, the, and on the OCA sides, um, you know, the, the industry has really struggled to scale. So struggled to scale um, in home markets, um, whether that's Kenya or Uganda or Rwanda, um, to really sustain that growth in those markets. And I think um, what's been even more challenging is, is for some of these larger vertically integrated businesses to actually export their model into new markets and even moving you know, right next door into a neighboring country, um, seemingly a fairly simple turn turnkey um, uh, situation is, is decidedly not. And um, so, you know, there's, there's a real clear um, impediment to, to the, the scalability of the model. And, you know, it's not to say that the first generation businesses um, uh, will not be able to continue to grow and, and will not succeed. I think they, they absolutely will. But I think um, going back to the, the observation about um, achieving universal access by 2030. Uh, we really need uh, a next generation, several generations of, of new um, energy access businesses um, uh, rolling out across the continent over the coming years. So for us, you know, this is what gave rise to the, the core thesis underpinning um, Venture Builder. So, you know, this, this premise that you have certain parts of the business model that can be taken off the shelf, um, notably on the technology side with um, the hardware that is increasingly commoditized and um, easy to, uh, relatively easy to procure. Um, also on the technology side, we're seeing increasing commoditization on the software side of things, both in terms of the payment intermediation and um, the CRM platforms that are needed to, to fuel um, the management of, of customer portfolios. And, um, you know, the second piece that we see that is increasingly um, readily available is, is on the financing side of things. As you saw, um, there is lots of capital flowing into the sector. Um, as, as Aaron pointed out, the bulk of that capital has gone to, um, you know, a, a handful of businesses across the continent. And, and so, you know, the view is that, um, that investors are, are willing and, and excited to, to invest into these businesses. Um, but what's really lacking is, that um, homegrown local knowledge. It's the distribution um, side of the business. And at the end of the day, that's what these businesses are. They, they need to know how to um, um, serve customers and understand what those customers want, aspire to, and can afford, and uh, need to understand how to get it to them in a sustainable and scalable way. And sustainability and scale uh, translates into unit economics that um, are profitable and and um, you know our view is that um, there are um, again as both Emma and Aaron alluded to there are hundreds if not thousands of local distributors already operating across the continent some of them are already operating at, at fairly substantial scale and that that is a, a latent resource that can be tapped to really make a meaningful dent in uh, Africa's energy access deficit so um, what we do is we look for, um, and this is uh, point one on this slide, we look for established uh, local enterprises, so that are um, both locally owned and managed, and um, that have been operating for, you know, typically in excess of three or four years, 
um, have demonstrated that they know how to operate, build and operate and scale a business in uh, their respective country and have also demonstrated that they can sell to the base of the pyramid. They can sell products um, into rural markets. And um, what we then do is work with those businesses and really take a very much of a, a sleeves rolled up approach um, and leverage the capabilities within our team. So again, on the, on the catalyst side of things, um, we draw a pool of experts, most of whom come from the industry themselves, um, either as early stage employees, founders of, um, of energy access businesses, or on the finance side of things, or on the, the B2B um, uh, technology intermediation side of things. And we also uh, marry that with the, the capabilities that Open Capital brings through its many years of uh, deep experience working with uh, energy access businesses uh, across across the continent, in particular in, in East Africa. And so um, what we do is we actually, even from the point that we identify the businesses, um, we enter into what we call a, a pre-investment phase of our enterprise development services um, to help the businesses get investment ready. And it also gives us an opportunity to better understand the business and, and de-risk our perspective downstream investment into them. And at the same time, we're also able to identify some of the critical weaknesses that they have and, um, and, and basically build out a package of, of bespoke um, advisory services that we fully fund and deliver as part of our uh, package of support. And um, again, that really varies depending on the specific business. Uh, some of them really need help on the technology side. Some of them need it on uh, sales, uh, several on the credit side of the business, some on core finance functions. It, it really varies and, and um, we, we develop a package that, that um, really helps either to mitigate risks um, as investors into the businesses or it um, helps to uh, add value into the business. Um, so that's gonna directly translate into an uptick in terms of revenue and hopefully uh, eventual profitability. So, um, you know, what we do is we look to partner long-term with businesses and enter into at least two years of uh, a partnership with them. The intention is that we, um, fully fund a portion of their needs over that two year period. So most importantly is the, the enterprise development services package that I mentioned. And then um, the, the second piece that we provide is what we think is the scarcest source of capital in the market um, these days, which is that earlier stage uh, risk tolerant equity financing. And so um, we will fully fund the business's equity capital needs during that two year period as well. And we'll work uh, very closely with the businesses to help them to leverage that equity capital that they bring in directly through the venture builder vehicle uh, to crowd in um, outside debt finance from specialized um, third party debt providers such as SEMA uh, and, and others. So in that way, um, you know, our view is that we are um, catering to what is missing for these local distributors in terms of uh, resources, both human and financial, that they need to, to, to scale their business into um, energy access and in some cases into the PAYGO business model. And we do that in a way that, that complements um, existing players that are in the market and, and really that's, that's what we're trying to do through VB is to, to leverage partnerships. Um, so we've been working uh, very intensely on Venture Builder over, over two years now. It's been 14 months that we've been in um, intense development of the, the model. And um, we initially have focused on three markets in West Africa, so Nigeria, Benin, and Burkina Faso, and um, are right now finalizing the, the uh, packages of support for our preferred candidates in each of those three, three markets, and um, are really looking forward to, to moving into the, the post-investment phase with each of those business in, in 2019. 
And you know, our vision is to to scale this model across the continent, and um, you know, bring in additional resources to enable us to um, to to support local enterprises in Central and Eastern Africa as well over over the coming years. So, um, as I mentioned, you know, in terms of of impact, um, our goal is to have somewhere between seven and 10 businesses in our portfolio and, um, you know, combined that those businesses would be able to deliver at least a, a million connections and having, you know, direct impact both on uh, carbon emission reductions and also also on the on the access deficit. Um, just a couple of quick links here. Uh, the first is to a white paper that we published a couple of months ago that uh, basically tells our story about the journey to date around Venture Builder and um, some of the core theses underpinning the model. And also a blog that we published uh, also a couple of months ago that appeared in, in Next Billion, um, again, to tell the, the Venture Builder story. So look forward to uh, the discussion and to questions from the audience. Thank you so much, Dan, and thank you to each of our panelists for their outstanding presentations. As we shift to the moderated discussion led by Rushi, I'd like to remind our attendees to please submit questions using the question pane at any time. We will also keep several links up on the screen throughout the, quick, uh, throughout the uh, discussion for quick reference, um, and those will point you to information about other upcoming and previously held webinars. Um, now I'd like to pass this to Rushi. Thanks, Philip. Thanks also to Dan, Emma, and Aaron for a series of rich presentations. Uh, we now have some time to field questions, and I'm going to use my moderator privileges and get us started with two questions and then open it up to audience questions afterwards. So really, my first question to all three of you is around the work on the need to disrupt off-grid electricity financing in Africa, referred by you, Aaron, and Dan, uh, who you obviously led the work. Uh, that talked about these new second and third generation off-grid solar companies that need to be seeded and sort of come to scale to get closer to achieving the SDG 7 goal. This is obviously linked to the whole challenging economics of last mile distribution. So these approaches proposed by all of you offer support for these enterprises and last mile distributors. I'm sure this process, and I know for some of you, it's, uh, it has involved these series of stakeholder consultations and involved reaching out to several practitioners as well as funders and investors. So I have a two-part question here. So number one, what are some of the things that stood out for you in these interactions? And part two, which I think Emma sort of alluded to in her presentation, is do the need of these practitioners match what investors have to offer? And are these practitioners able to deliver on the social impact and scale that investors are looking for? And then the second question that I have is more specifically towards uh, for Aaron and Dan, which is around what are some of the criteria that you look for in candidates for financing? I'm curious to hear if there are any characteristics that you look for in distributors during the screening stage. So I'll stop now and over to uh, any of you who want to start, get started first. Emma, do you want to start? Not to put you on a spot. Yeah, no, that's fine. Happy to happy to start. Um, so I'll respond to your first question around the needs of practitioners uh, and how that sits against uh, what investors are, uh, are offering. Um, so I think broadly there is a mismatch, um, and that's clearly changing with players like SEMA and uh, Venture Builder coming to the table. Um, there are some existing funders that are providing. Uh, appropriate financing for, for distributors. So some examples would be uh, DPRIZE, uh, who provides seed funding for, uh, for early stage distribution companies, uh, Transform, which is a differed Unilever partnership, uh, which provides a, a support for distributors to test innovations in their business model, um, and Shell Foundation, which invests in a couple of individual distribution companies. So it is happening to, to to some extent, but on a relatively small scale and with a with a small number of kind of well known established established players. Um, and so I think broadly the problem is that funders and investors aren't interested in in last mile distribution, and that's for for a couple of reasons. So first of all, uh, they tend to focus more on technology innovation than on supply chain innovation. Um, 
Secondly, a lot of distributors work across product categories, not just within energy, um, and that doesn't fit neatly into a funder's uh, sectoral focus area. Um, you know, the, the, the funding world tends to be very segmented uh, by sector. Um, thirdly, while uh, while there is a lot of debt now coming into the off-grid space, um, distributors tend to lack strong track record and collateral and require pretty small ticket size loans compared to what most funders are looking for. So there's a, a, a real mismatch there. Um, and then finally, there is this kind of perception that the unit economics of distribution just don't work. Um, but there are models that exist that have proven uh, viability at a unit level um, and there is a lot of innovation in the space which is helping to improve the unit economics of distributors like the emergence of PAYGO technology specialists like Angaza. Um, so I think we, we are seeing a mismatch and distributors broadly aren't having their, their financing needs um, catered for but as I say I do think that is is now starting to change with these kind of innovative more more targeted players uh, like SEMA and Venture Builder. Um, so I'd better hand over to them <laughs> to give you a bit more insight. Yeah, Thanks so this so is Dan. I'm happy to happy to jump in. Sorry. No, go ahead, Dan. Okay, super. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, Ruchi, to the first part of your question in terms of the practitioners um, and and their their view and sort of looking at that as the the demand side of the equation. Um, you know, I I think that the the typology of those practitioners are are different than um, the practitioners that uh, particularly investors have have focused on in in the past um, five to ten years in the in the energy access space. And you know, fundamentally, the needs of those practitioners are different. Um, the capabilities of those practitioners are different, and so it's it's a really uh, different approach that needs to be taken to supporting them to deliver access. Um, and I think, you know, flipping over to the supply side with, with respect to the investors, you know, as, as Emma alluded to, I, I do think that there are, um, you know, the, the, the short list of, of um, existing invent investors and impact investors who have been very focused on, on this space for several years. And I think um, they are going to be absolutely critical to um, supporting this next generation of businesses to thrive on the continent. And um, you know, in order for that to happen, um, you know, the the platform that Aaron was speaking about and, and Venture Builder um, need to need to to, to uh, achieve their proof points and scale. And I hope that you know many more platforms similar to this will will pop up. Um, across the continent and hopefully not just for energy access but for for other verticals as well and um, you know I think that the risk there is that the established investors um, quite often either um, perceive that sort of energy access is solved and that the the winners have been chosen and if you just keep capitalizing the winners then um, then then that's that's those are the horses to bet on um, I do think that the data you know empirically shows that that um, uh, is not going to be the case at least if you're you're trying to achieve universal access across the continent um, or you know the other the other challenge for investors is that um, they've already they've already placed their bets and so um, you know they they see um, the you need to you need to demonstrate the differentiation in terms of you know what Aaron described and what I described through venture builder and how that is different from a, a more classic sort of equity play into a um, a vertically integrated business or a, a tech uh, tech focused uh, business that that typically is attractive to those uh, those types of investors. And I, um, Evan, do you have something to add? Yeah, I mean, to your to your second question about sort of criteria and what we're looking for, um, you know, I think it probably falls somewhere in the in the middle um, between 
you know, Global Distributors Collective is really focused on um, like younger, younger players. Um, but, you know, to have a sustainable fund, um, the, the ticket size per company needs to be, you know, a manageable number of companies within, within the fund. Um, so I'm thinking, you know, if we're, we will do some tranched funding. So say we commit a package of 500,000 or a million dollars to a company. Um, we're looking at that over time. Um, but still, if you're, taking on $250,000 of inventory financing, say that's 5,000 products. Um, you know, you need to, the company needs to be able to, you know, efficiently manage that over 18 months or whatever their, you know, kind of payment plan is. Um, so that's sort of, you know, it's still a constraint on our side about the, the how small of a company we can go to. Um, and then, you know, other than that, criteria wise, you know, we're looking for companies operating across Asia, Africa, Central America, Latin America. Um, we don't have a particular um, geography in mind because I think these types of companies are everywhere. Um, and then I would say, you know, track record wise, um, you've been in business for a few years. Um, and then I think one of the biggest things that I think I alluded to earlier is just, you know, information. Um, so do you have a, you know, a viable sort of business model that you can share? Like what can SEMA as an investor sink our teeth into? So do you have a, an investor pitch book? Do you have, you know, a financial model? Do you have projections? Um, these are all sort of uh, basic things. Um, but, you know, when you're running a, a company, sometimes, you know, it's not, it's not the, the most important thing. Um, but for an investor, um, the way that you present information is very important um, to, to enable us to make um, a decision. Uh, so I think that's also where, you know, this platform idea and just sharing of information um, comes into play because all of these items that I mentioned aren't rocket science in any, any way. They're basic items that could be, you know, largely distributed to um, these companies. Fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm now going to hand it back to Philippe uh, to see if uh, we have some questions from the audience. Thank you, Rishi. Okay. We have some, uh, some great questions from the audience here, and I'd like to remind our audience to continue submitting questions using the question button. Um, in the meantime, I will turn to a question from Elise. Um, it's for Emma. It asks, what kind of partnerships do you think are key for distributors reaching underserved populations? Um, and could you comment on the interaction between NGOs and governments and, and what could be done to improve it? Emma? Great, thanks for that question. Um, so in terms of what partnerships are important, uh, I think the, the, the focus has really been on technology partnerships. So um, distributors uh, trying to find the most appropriate product for their, for their market, uh, and then the, the, the best supplier who they can work with um, to deliver that product. Um, that has been kind of the most important partnership for distributors. Uh, there is kind of a lack of service providers out there that are specifically serving distributors and, and, and meeting their particular needs. So to date, there haven't been a huge range of partnership um, options available for distributors. Um, in saying that, that is starting to change. So as you have uh, some centralized support services emerging like Angaza, um, who provides uh, a pay-as-you-go platform for distributors, specifically for distributors. We're starting to see some sort of centralized uh, software solutions emerge. Um, again, that's something that Angaza is looking at and also other players such as um, Shell Foundation's Catalyst. Um, I think there's a huge opportunity there 
to develop additional centralized uh, support services and particularly in the area of, of, of training. I feel there's a real kind of market gap there. Um, one other sort of uh, key partnership area is around investment readiness. Um, and there are some uh, organizations out there that provide that type of, of support. One example is the Miller Center for Social Entrepreneurship um, that provides uh, in, an incubation and accelerator program and, and has run dedicated cohorts for distribution companies. Um, and I think more of that is, is needed and it's exciting to see that that is kind of a real uh, a critical part, piece of what um, Venture Builder is looking to provide as well. Um, so there are sort of limited partnership options uh, for distributors right now. Um, in terms of NGOs and, and governments, um, I think we're not seeing much collaboration between distributors and, and, and those actors right now. Um, I think Dharma Life in, in India is a good example of really effective collaboration between governments um, and, and Dharma Life as a distribution company, but that's quite rare in the space. Um, so definitely an opportunity to explore what those relationships could look like, uh, but I think that's still a little bit of a, a, a question mark uh, right now. Thank you so much. I have another question here, and this is for Aaron. Um, it's asking about the product side of the equation as opposed to the distribution side. That is to say, what can be done to ensure that the product which distributors are providing, it can be of a consistently high quality. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, we go about this in, in different ways. Um, companies that we typically work with, um, work with uh, products, you know, from Greenlight Planet, um, B box and 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 others, Victron. You know, most of the uh, products are lighting global certified, um, and so in our underwriting criteria, we'll always, um, you know, try to check that box. Um, but for times when you know you're you're building um, your own product. Um, you know, some of the productive use products are are larger and, and built um, by the company themselves. Um, we will engage um, a consultant uh, who can look at the, the product quality because um, we don't have that expertise in-house necessarily. Um, but I think those are the two things that we we would rely on. Um, but I think it also comes back to a potential, um, you know, um, possibility for Global Distributors Collective. Um, and something that I, I believe, Emma, you're working on is um, product quality and just having sort of a database of saying, you know, these these products have been vetted and are of high quality. Emma, do you wish to comment on that? Uh, so it, that's, it's not actually something that we're looking at very closely. Gogla, the Global Off-Grid Lighting Association, is doing a lot of, of really great work around um, consumer protection and product quality. Um, it's not something that we're looking at closely. Um, in saying that, I mean, as Erin, you, you mentioned, something that we are looking at doing is some sort of uh, a trip advisor, if you like, for uh, these kinds of, of products, um, uh, solar products and other products, um, where distributors can access information about products that is uh, relevant for, for them. So not just sort of the technical specs of various products, but also, you know, what products have a have a warranty, how long does it take to, um, to provide service on, on a product, um, is, are these products available in my region and what are the sort of taxes that I, taxes that I have to pay on these products and that type of information is very very difficult for distributors to access right now um, but that is more about supporting distributors with access to information um, about uh, about those products as opposed to, to uh, verifying um, quality you know through some sort of independent verification which is kind of outside of our of our scope at this point in time Thank you so much, Emma. I have a question here for Dan. It is, when you're screening, 
what's the most important characteristic you look for in African distributors? Great, thanks. Thanks, Phil, for that question. Um, yeah, I think for us, there's, and you know, Aaron alluded to several core criteria in terms of um, the track record, and um, you know, we also look for businesses to um, be targeting rural rural uh, consumer bases. Um, you know, fundamental fundamental criteria such as those. Um, also, with you know, a, a product offering that does cater to the base of the pyramid, so we directly focus on enterprises if they are already selling solar products um, that are are selling smaller scale systems including solar lanterns um, we opted out several times on businesses that were selling larger kind of tier two tier three um, solar home system solutions uh, just by virtue of the fact that that wasn't really catering to uh, the demographic that we're, we're interested in in um, um, delivering access to through venture builder i think the most important criterion for us is is actually a qualitative one, and it's about the the willingness of the entrepreneurs to partner with us, and um, you know that they they understand that there are certain parts of their business that they need help with, and they're looking for partners who can support them. Um, to, to troubleshoot and and you know work work out solutions for for some of those challenges that they're facing um, you know that's really our our differentiation in that um, we're we're really looking to 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 partner very closely with these businesses so there absolutely has to be that um, that political will on the on the enterprise side so so for us that is a um, a, a deal breaker if if we're not able to get that clear sense of of trust and and a real strong relationship, then then we would opt out on on that potential collaboration. Great, thank you, Dan. I have a question that's actually directed to Aaron, but I think I'd like to get a little bit of input from everybody on the panel for this one. Um, it's speaking to the issues that uh, pertain to different regions. It says, uh, could you talk a little bit about specific regions, including Africa and Latin America? Specifically, the challenges in those different regions. Uh, could we start with Aaron? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, we haven't worked as much in Latin America and are, are getting to know that market a little bit better. Um, I think one of the sort of biggest uh, challenges. I, I guess I would say two things in Africa. One is, you know, just kind of the the uncontrollable factor of the the political and country environment. Um, you know, every every few years when elections happen, um, kind of rears its ugly head and and takes a toll on the market and people's um, you know customers ability to um, you know basically service their their loan to the off-grid company in time um, so I think uh, that's a big challenge for Africa um, and then I think the second thing that we see sort of um, you know on a country by country basis ties into the the discussion we were having before about product quality and also product appropriateness. Um, so I think each country, region, you know, so, sometimes village, um, you know, really honing in on what the appropriate product is for your your customer market um, has a you know a huge impact on the success of your business. Um, I think in in Latin America, you know, with the, especially in South America, with the um, the grid being more available, um, I think Central America is probably more of a target for us in terms of you know these companies being able to to operate at scale. Um, but would love to hear uh, the other panelists' opinions. 
Okay, I'll, can I pass this question off to Rushi now? Uh, or MR Dan. <laughs> Uh, yeah, sure. I'm happy to, to jump in. Um, uh, I think there, fundamentally uh, there are a lot of similarities with challenges and with business models across regions and that's also across product categories as well. Um, but there are sort of some uh, differentiating factors. So, for example, when you look at at procurement and some of the challenges around procurement. Um, in East Africa, that's much less of a challenge because a lot of suppliers have set up uh, their, their, their own um, uh, their own intermediaries in country which manage you know uh, procurement directly from China and 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 do their own kind of warehousing and 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 support with logistics which makes it much easier for distributors um, in East Africa um, whereas in in other uh, parts of the world where those intermediaries don't exist distributors are having to you know order those products directly from China and manage um, that entire sort of part of the supply chain themselves, which is complex and, and time consuming um, and, and adds extra expense. Um, something like the presence of mobile money can obviously make um, the provision of credit much easier. So in a place like India where mobile money hasn't really penetrated, um, that means that uh, distributors have to deal in a lot more cash, um, which is, is higher risk and, and, and creates uh, challenges in, in, in managing a sales force. Um, uh, when you look at customer awareness of products, that can differ quite substantially depending on the market. So again, in a market like East Africa, where um, solar is is solar lights are, are quite a familiar technology to a lot of people. Um, you do obviously have challenges that Erin touched on earlier um, around uh, quality and the the uh, and quality control um, having um, damaged sort of the reputation of solar in some areas. But at least customers have a familiarity with the the product and and its offering. Um, whereas in other uh, markets where uh, the, the, the technology is, is kind of brand new. There's a lot more work that has to go into simply um, explaining um, how that product works. Um, and that, again, can, can add quite a significant expense if, you know, you're not able to, to make a sale the first sort of five times that you visit a village or a community because you're still trying to explain and demonstrate sort of the product itself. Um, uh, and finally, I I guess uh, Salesforce churn tends to be quite market specific as well. Um, a, a really, really big problem with distributors operating in, in India um, and maybe less of a challenge in somewhere like Latin America. Um, and, 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 and that can um, really sort of hold distributors back from effectively scaling when they're constantly sort of having to recruit and, and train new staff and, and, and develop effective uh, retention strategies. Um, so I think those are kind of some examples of 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 where um, challenges can differ and where business models have to respond appropriately. But more broadly, I think there are more commonalities than there than there are differences. Rushi, you are picking up there for a moment. So I'm going to return to you. Thanks, Philip. No, I think Emma pretty much covered uh, what I had to say. I also wanted to sort of quickly uh, jump in to add the whole capacity issue, but as well as around customer awareness, but Emma covered it all, so I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Well, I will still return to Rushi for one more question, and that is what we can expect in terms of uh, the time aspect of setting up the structures we've discussed so far in this webinar. Thanks, Philippe. And that was a question I wanted to pose to all of you uh, panelists to, to respond to what is the kind of timeline we're looking at uh, setting up these structures and have them up and running. I know, Emma, you already have certain aspects of your uh, of GDC up and running, but what timeline are we looking at the delivery of some of the components that you mentioned? And, uh, and uh, this, the same question to Erin and Dan, uh, when are you looking for some of these services to be available to some of our audience members, but also these practitioners? Uh, so the Global Distributors Collective is is live and our work is underway. Um, so uh, we are we've begun our sort of scoping study to look at uh, the best business model for our centralized purchasing platform, and we'll be piloting 
starting that pilot probably in March next year. Um, our learning and collaboration, and collaboration events will be starting from mid next year as well. Um, we will be doing a call for innovation pilots probably in February, March next year. We're designing exactly what those pilots will look like. And again, we'll be consulting heavily with our members to define the specific innovation challenges we'll be, we'll be focusing on. Um, and then we'll be looking to, to do sort of knowledge exchange and matchmaking and facilitation kind of broadly um, through our, our, our network as of now. Um, so things are, are, are very much underway. For us at SEMA, um, we've, you know, already launched this sort of inventory PAYGO debt financing. Um, so we're actively uh, sourcing deals for that um, and making those types of investments um, and still continue to get to know this segment of the market better. Um, in terms of launching the consortium, um, we are raising outside money for that. And so we are um, targeting a launch of next year. Um, but as everybody knows how fundraising goes, um, it can take you know, longer than you expect. Um, but we're hoping for, for next year. Great. And um, on the venture builder side, you know, as I mentioned, um, we've been building out our pipeline for, for over a year now. So we, we first started engaging in Nigeria, Brennan and Burkina Faso uh, in the fall of, of 2017. And we are right now um, finalizing the, the detailed terms of our partnerships with um, each of our preferred candidates in, in each of those markets. And we'll be looking to uh, close the, the financing and the, the advisory packages with them in very early 2019. Uh, in parallel, uh, we will begin scoping uh, new opportunities in at least one or two markets in East Africa. And so we'll be, we'll be out uh, looking for, for promising local distributors that we could, we could partner with in, in the East. And um, we'll continue to um, also uh, raise funds into Venture Builder itself to enable us to uh, deliver to our, our local distribution partners. And the, the fundraising is a, um, a, a, a continuous endeavor um, and, and will be continuing well into the future. Uh, thank you again to everyone for that informative Q&A session. We only have a few minutes left now. And uh, for any questions we didn't have time to get to, we will connect with those attendees offline after the webinar. For now, I'd like to provide the panelists with an opportunity to provide any additional or closing remarks um, they'd like to before we close out the webinar. We'll start with Rushi. Thanks, Philippe. Uh, I'll just keep it very short. I want to extend thanks and gratitude on behalf of the UN Foundation to all our panelists for participating. I think all the panel, uh, all the presentations uh, demonstrated the depth and the width of uh, the extent of support and effort that you and your organizations are placing on this issue. Uh, we're very pleased to be a partner to you and look forward to continuing our collaboration in this space. And a final thank you to all of those who took out the time to join us for the webinar today. Thank you. And Emma? Uh, thanks. I, I, nothing substantive. Just thank you very much to UN Foundation and my fellow panelists. And it's just really exciting for me that something that really wasn't on anyone's agenda, you know, just five years ago is now sort of coming front and centre. And there's this real recognition that distribution does have this vital role to play and that more support is needed and the types of support that is now being provided is is exactly what distributors need to to thrive and to, to scale. So just really exciting to see the sector um, be at this point. Um, and if you're interested in, in, in learning more about the Distributors Collective or joining the Distributors Collective or partnering with us, then please do uh, get in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. And Erin? Thank you guys so much for your time today. Um, and I think the only thing I'd like to say is that I'd love to hear from everybody. Um, feel free to drop me an email at erin at Um, You know, if you're interested in partnering or borrowing or investing, um, would 
would be great to connect. Thank you, Aaron. And finally to Dan. Yes, uh, just to reiterate uh, uh, previous comments that were made, and I think, you know, first of all, to, to thank, um, thank you all for organizing this. And yeah, we very much want to keep in touch. And, you know, we're, we're, we're climbing a very steep learning curve on our side, and we really want to share those learnings and experiences with the, the broader practitioner community. So please, please do reach out and, and we ourselves are going to be deliberately trying to, to um, uh, open source some of our learnings as we, as we continue building Venture Builder. So thanks. Great, thank you. On behalf of Clean Energy Solutions Center, I'd like to extend a thank you to all of our expert panelists and to our attendees for participating in today's webinar. We very much appreciate your time and hope in return that there were some valuable insights that you could take back to your ministries, departments, or organizations. We also invite you to inform your colleagues and those in your networks about Solutions Center resources and services, including no-cost no policy support through our Ask an Expert service. I invite you to check the Solutions Center website if you would like to view the slides and listen to a recording of today's presentations, as well as previously held webinars. Additionally, you will find information on upcoming webinars and other training events. We are also now posting webinar recordings to the Clean Energy Solutions Center YouTube channel. Please allow for about one week for the audio recording to be posted. Finally, I would like to kindly ask you to take a moment to complete the short survey that will appear when we conclude our webinar. Please enjoy the rest of your day, and we hope to see you again at future Clean Energy Solutions Center events. This concludes our webinar.